Well, amen. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. I pray that you can sing that too. You know, there's a misconception in our world that um, everyone is a child of God. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that we are all God's creation, but those who have trusted in Jesus Christ for salvation become children of God. And so I pray today that you are a child of God. Well, this morning we are going to continue in our ever-growing series in 1 Corinthians. We're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and we're going to be looking at the first five verses of chapter 13. Probably uh, uh, one of, definitely the most well-known chapter in 1 Corinthians, and for many, maybe the most well-known chapter in all of the Bible, as it has been read at many, uh, many a wedding uh, ceremonies. I'm going to read God's Word, we'll pray, and we'll see what God has for us today. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, starting with verse 1. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I do thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you that we have the opportunity to gather in this place. That we have the freedom to gather without fear of persecution, without fear of retaliation, but that we can gather in this house and worship. Lord, I pray that we wouldn't take that liberty that we have for granted. But Lord, that we would take the opportunity to worship you in spirit and in truth and to take this worship with us when we go out these doors later today. Lord, I pray that as we continue our worship through the study of your word, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would have its way. Lord, I pray that you would set me to the side and that it would be your word that is prominent in this place this morning, that you would be glorified that we would worship through this word today. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. As we finished out chapter 12 last week, and throughout chapter 12, Paul has turned his attention to spiritual gifts within the church. And he addresses the different kinds of spiritual gifts, the different uses for those spiritual gifts. And then chapter 12 um, of, of 1 Corinthians uh, ends uh, with, with the verse... Uh, um, It ends with the verse, but earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. Now, last week I talked about how that 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 verse um, is probably not the best translation of what is meant there. Because when we really, again, contemplate what Paul has been talking about to the Corinthians as he's been addressing them with the different problems that are happening at the church in Corinth, what we see is we see the people at the church in Corinth fighting for position. We see the people in Corinth having issues one with another, and they're wanting to have these spiritual gifts so that they can have some clout or power or position within the church. And so while many people have read that verse as saying that we need to earnestly desire the the greater gifts, I think what Paul was actually saying is he's saying, you all are clamoring for more recognition, for more gifts, for more things that would uh, pump you up, that would make you seem greater or better within the church. But he says, let me show you a better way. That's the Joe Lemon's interpretation of the last verse, verse 31 of chapter 12. And in chapter 13 is the pinnacle point in Paul's letter. He's been addressing the conflict, the division at the church in Corinth. There's been a lack of unity. There's been individuals jockeying for position, for power, for prominence. There's been a disregard for one another. And there's been an abuse and a misuse of spiritual gifts within the church. And in chapter 13, Paul turns to the crux of the situation that there is a lack of love in the church at Corinth. Here's the problem with that. 
In 1 John chapter 4, verse 16, we read that God is love. And so if there's been a lack of love in the church, then there's been a lack of God in the church. There's a few different Greek words that are translated as love into the English language. As a matter of fact, one of the problems with translating the Bible in general, the New Testament in particular, from uh, the original language into English, is, is just the, the translation difficulties. Love is one of those. There, from the Greek, there's three or four different words that can be translated uh, into, as love within the English language. The most common one used in the New Testament is agape. It is a word used when we read in 1 John that God is love. It is the word used when we read that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. It is the word used when we read that God demonstrated His love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It's the word used when we are told to love the Lord our God with all that we are. And it is the word used when we are told to love our neighbor as ourselves. And it is the word used multiple times when Jesus says, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. John chapter 13 verses 34 through 35. In that passage there in John Jesus says, I give you a new commandment. But it really wasn't a new commandment. He was restating the commands he had been giving throughout his earthly ministry. And that was that we're called to love one another as God has loved us. One of the best ways to understand the full meaning of a word is to see how it's used within the rest of the Bible. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we are provided with the most thorough definition of the word agape, which is translated into love. It's different than the word eros, which is a Greek word that is used to talk about the romantic love that is experienced between husbands and wives. It's also different than the word um, phile, where we get like the term Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. It's a brotherly companion love. Agape is different from those. And in, Paul, and in chapter 13, Paul shows us, he expresses the need for love to be central in exercising spiritual gifts and for the church to function in the way that God designed the church to function. And he begins with, If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or clanging cymbal. Paul is probably not talking about the gifts of tongues here, but is referring to the gifts of preaching and teaching. We don't read anywhere in the Bible about angels having their own special language. But regardless, what Paul is expressing is that even if we have elegant speech, even if like the angels in the Bible who bring messages from God Himself, if we don't have love, then it's just noise. We all understand noise, don't we? When I was in high school, I, I, I played the drums. I actually started playing drums in, in middle school, in band. In high school, I played in marching band and concert band and stage band and jazz band. Whatever I could play in, I enjoyed uh, being able to play. And I always remember how that right before class would start, especially during concert season, everyone would be warming up by playing their instruments. No one was playing together. Everyone would just be doing something to warm up, and it was noisy. If you've ever been in that situation, you understand what I'm talking about. Everybody's doing their scales or making noise and some people are just talking and it's just noisy. You always got those drummers back there in the back hitting something, making noise, disturbing everybody. (laughs) No one was playing together. Everyone was just doing something to warm up. But once the director started class and had everyone play together, the same instruments playing many of the same things as before. But put together with purpose, it made a beautiful sound. When we speak the truth of God's Word with love and with purpose, it's not just noise, but it's a beautiful melody of God's truth. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. Prophecy, knowledge, and faith are all spiritual gifts that Paul references, talks about in chapter 12, which we looked at over the last few weeks. 
We can have in-depth knowledge of God's Word. We can pour over God's Word. We can study God's Word. God can give us the gift of knowledge in which we can read God's Word and understand its mysteries. I'm always amazed at, at individuals. I have to use a lot of tools. When I'm doing sermon prep, when I'm, when I'm getting ready to preach, I use a lot of different tools to, to draw the parallels in God's Word. There's some people who just, they read it once and they remember it, and so they can read a passage in God's Word and understand the references that it makes to the Old Testament and the connections it makes to the New Testament and all those interrelatedness. I'm not like that. I, I'm, I'm blessed by people who have that gift who write books to help me be a better preacher. But if we have all the, we, we can have the in depth knowledge of God's word. Not only that, we can have the ability to speak the truth of God's word. This, this idea of prophecy is the, is the declaring of God's word. The prophets of old declared that Jesus Christ would be coming, the Messiah would be coming. Some people say if you want to be a prophet today, all you got to do is declare that Jesus Christ is coming again, which is true. But whichever way we want to take a prophecy is the declaration of God's truth. And we can have the ability to speak God's truth, to speak God's word. And we can even have the greatest of faith, the faith to move mountains. Jesus said in the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 17, verse 20, For truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. And nothing will be impossible for you. But if we don't have love, we are nothing. That's what Paul says. Paul literally says that if we have these incredible gifts, but don't have love, we are nothing. Paul goes on to say, if I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. We can be the most giving, generous person, giving all that we have to the poor and those in need. We can even lay down our lives for the sake of the gospel. But Paul says, if we don't have love, it means nothing. We gain nothing. Why? Why are all those things, if we were to do those things... If, if, if we have the, the gift of prophecy, the gift of knowledge, if we're able to speak the truth of God's Word, if we have the gift of generosity in which we give away to the poor, if we lay down our very lives for the sake of the gospel, but Paul says in all of that, if we don't have love, it's meaningless. Why? Because God is love. And if we don't have God, we have nothing. It doesn't matter how good we are. How hard we try. See, the problem in our world is that, especially in, in the culture in which we live in the United States of America, we think of the justice system, right? The scales, they need to balance. And so in our finite minds, we can get confused into thinking as long as the good deeds that we do outweigh the bad deeds that we do, then we're righteous. We are justified. But the problem is that the Word of God says that none is righteous, no, not one. God's Word says that all our deeds are like filthy rags. We don't have righteousness in and of ourselves. The Bible says that if we're guilty of breaking one of the commandments, we're guilty of breaking all of the commandments. And we stand guilty before a holy God. We need God. We need God in us. The Spirit of God working in us. It's what allows the spiritual gifts to work for the purposes for which God called them because God is love. Listen to what John writes about love. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. Let me read that again just in case we missed it. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because he is so also, because he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fears. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. 
For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. That's why when Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? He said, well, the first and greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. I mean, the summation of that is that we're supposed to love God with everything that we have. Jesus says that's the first and greatest commandment. He says the second is like it, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Why would Jesus give two commands when he was only asked for one? Well, because we can't accomplish the first unless we accomplish the second. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. Because when we demonstrate love to our neighbors, when we demonstrate love to our brothers and sisters in Christ, when we demonstrate love to the world that doesn't even know what real love is apart from God, we show, we demonstrate God's love to them. And when we love people with that love of God, we're showing love to God. We get to be that funnel. We get, we get to be that, that, I always think about it as like the, the drain pipe at the end of your gutters. You know what I mean? Like all that water pours down on your roof and it pours down into the gutter and it goes down. And man, when there's, when there's a lot of water coming, that water's just gushing out of the bottom of that pipe. And that's how we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be that conduit in which God's love pours into us and through us it pours out to the world to demonstrate and tell people who God is because of His great love for them. But what is love? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because we're confused in this world today. According to the world today, love is love. Makes sense. But the problem is you can't define a word by using the word itself. The world tells us that love is letting people do whatever they want. Any type of anger or even correction is not loving according to the pattern of this world. But God is love and Jesus is God. Therefore, when Jesus overturned the tables in the temple and drove out the money changers, He was acting in love. And when Jesus rebuked sinners and corrected sinful ways... He was acting in love. So what is love? Well, let's begin looking at that today and we'll continue next week. Love is patient. Love is kind. i got to stop for a second because when I say love is patient, I can just I, the only thing I can come to is I need to start checking myself when I drive down the street. Because Joe Lemons is not very loving when he drives his car down the streets of Bradenton. And oftentimes I pray, Lord, don't let that be one of the church members who recognizes me. (laughs) Somebody gave me a Calvary sticker to put on the back of my car and I hadn't put it there yet because I need to get right with God about my driving before I do that so I don't tarnish the name of the church. Love is patient. That's easy. Now listen, it's easy to talk about driving, right? Because we can all relate to when we haven't been patient when we're driving. But what about when we're home with our spouse, with our children, with our family members? Our families will often see the very worst of us and our impatience and our selfishness. But love is patient. Love is kind. And, and, and love being kind, it's, it's this concept that, 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 we're, that we're not haughty, we're not self-centered, we're not thinking of self, but that we're showing love, that we're showing kindness, that we're showing care for someone else. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Depending on the translation, your Bible might say love is not jealous. Jealousy is self-serving. As I was reading and studying, I read one example of a girl came to her pastor and she was distraught and she said, this, there's this young man who said he loves me and if I don't go out with him, he'll kill himself. What should I do? And the pastor said, nothing, he doesn't love you. Because if he loved her, he wouldn't say things like that. Because that's jealousy, that's self-seeking. Love doesn't seek our own. Love doesn't desire for ourselves, but it thinks of others as more important. Love does not boast. Your translation might say love does not brag. It's pretty easy, right, for, those, for us to understand that someone who is braggadocious, someone who's braggy, we don't think of those as being very loving people. But again, in all these aspects of love, it's self-denial and it's putting others first. And so in the idea that love does not brag or love does not boast, 
Love isn't about building ourself up. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not boast. Love is not arrogant or rude. Your translation might say that love is not acting un- unbecomingly. We again understand this concept that when we're arrogant, when we're rude, we think that we're the most important thing in the world. And that's, that's the contrariness to love. Because again, if love is thinking about others, when we're arrogant and rude, we're only thinking about self. Love does not insist on its own way. Or your translation may say that love does not seek its own. So I always ask my wife where she wants to go to dinner. Even though she doesn't have an answer. Hey, men, you want to... Men, any, any of you got that? Did you say, honey, where do you want to go to dinner? And they say, anywhere's fine. And then you say, well, let's go to such and such. And no, I don't want to go there. <laughs> and you say, well, well, how about such and such? No, I don't want to go there. Well, where do you want to go? Well, anywhere's fine. <laughs> now, wives, cover your ears. I'm going to give your husband a trick today, okay? Men, what you do is you get in the car and you say, guess where I'm taking you to lunch? <laughs> And when she says somewhere, you go, you guessed it. That's free. There's no charge for that, okay? (laughs) Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not boast. Love is not arrogant or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. Love is not irritable. Or love is not provoked. That goes kind of back to that love is patient, right? If we love someone, then we should overlook when they have a bad day. Does anybody ever have a bad day? Some of y'all are lying. I mean, now come on. Everybody has a bad day, right? And if I have a bad day, that means my wife's going to have a bad day. And if I love my wife, then her bad day should be okay, right? Because we all have a bad day. I don't know how it goes in your family. And my wife is in the nursery today, so she can't defend herself. But, um, you know, usually in our house, in our our marriage, it goes something like this. I get irritated about something and speak harshly to my wife. And then she receives that so well that she speaks harshly back to me. Which then I go, I'm sorry, I was wrong. No, usually not on that go-around. It kind of goes back and forth because we're each thinking about ourselves and that we've been offended, that we've been hurt, that they've talked harshly to me. I didn't deserve that kind of talk. Love does not seek its own. Love is not provoked. I probably need to be a little more loving when my wife has a bad day. Love is not resentful. Your translation might say that love does not take into account a wrong suffered. Man, could you imagine what the world would look like? Can you just imagine what the church would look like if each one of us always lived and, and acted and came into this family with patience and kindness, with no jealousy and no bragging, never acting unbecomingly or seeking our own, never provoked, and not taking into an account a wrong suffered? And, and listen... We hear all those things, and and that's what we want, right? Man, if you really love me, you won't take into account the wrong I suffered you. That that train needs to travel both ways. Right? I mean, if if we're the family of God, if we're the church, if we're the people of God, then we should assume the very best about each and every brother and sister in Christ who's sitting in this room, right? Shouldn't we just assume the best? Shouldn't we just go ahead and give grace? That man, even if they were wrong in what they did, they probably didn't really mean to or they're having a bad day and I love them too much to hold that against them. Shouldn't we just go ahead and start from that point of like you're forgiven? Well, I haven't offended you yet. That's okay. When you do, you're still forgiven. Because those of us who've been forgiven much need to forgive much. And God forgave me. That in my sinfulness, Jesus Christ died on that cross for me. While I was still an enemy of God, He sent Jesus Christ to pay the price for my sins. The perfect, holy Word of God, who all things were created through and who by all things are sustained, 
forgave me. Who am I to hold anything against somebody else if Jesus Christ doesn't hold my sins against me? You know, there's an expression. It's talk is cheap. All these things that describe love that we've looked at today and that we'll look at next week are action words. Love is action. So some of y'all I know have heard, have heard the story. We were actually just talking about this the other day. You know, it took me two years to talk Becky into dating me. All right? Two years. I'm the poster child for persistence. It was August 7th, 2003, when Becky said those magical words, I guess we're dating now. I'd worn her down, you know. Now, we started dating on August 7, 2003. We got married uh, November 26, 2005. I had to say the number in my head to get it out. 11-26-05. Got married 11 25 Now, I proposed about eight months or so before that. So that means that we dated um, for like a, a year and seven months, I think it is, something like that before I asked her to marry me. Do you know in all that time that we dated, I never once said, Becky, I love you. Did you know that? That for like a year and seven months or whatever it was, and and then all the time before that when I was trying to talk her into dating, I never once said, Becky, I love you. Because I kind of just had this idea that I wasn't going to say, Becky, I love you, until I could follow it up with, will you marry me? But if you ask Becky, and again, she's not here to defend herself, but you can see, see her after church, you can ask her. Becky, did you know Joe loved you during that year and seven months that you were dating? She would say, oh yeah. And if you said why, she would tell you it's because of the way he treated me. See, after that year and seven months, I remember I took Becky out to dinner. And, and let, me, let me tell you, that it, um, it's kind of a funny story because I was having internal gut pains. Like, not just like upset stomach, I was running a fever. But I was determined. I'd, I'd, already, uh, I'd already had the conversation with the man who's now my father-in-law. I made the mistake of giving him a heads up that I wanted to talk to him. And when I showed up to talk to him, he had like a legal pad full of things to talk to me about. Hey, don't worry. It's coming for the boys who want to date my girls too, all right? In 10 or 20 years, whenever that happens. But anyways, I was ready, so I took Becky out to dinner. I didn't eat very much that night. I was sick to my stomach. We went back. I was working at Manatee Baptist Church at the time. And as y'all know, I talked about this last week. Becky's not the one who wants to be in front of people. If I had proposed to her at the restaurant, she probably would have said no. Uh, nah. But she, that was not what she would want. So we went back to the church. It was just the two of us. And I'd set it up before Anna took her into the sanctuary. And I set her down and I washed her feet. Because I said, Jesus washed his disciples' feet because he, wanted to be, he, he was demonstrating being a servant leader. And I said, in my marriage, I want to be a servant leader. And I said, Becky, I love you. Will you marry me? And she said, have you talked to my father? <laughs> she did eventually say, yes, we're married. We got all these kids and it's a wonderful life. But I tell you all that to say that I didn't have to tell Becky I loved her. I demonstrated that I loved her. So that that night when I got down on one knee and I said, Becky, I love you, will you marry me? She didn't have to question if I loved her because I demonstrated my love for her. Talk is cheap. God demonstrated his love for us and that while we were still sinners, enemies of God, Christ died for us. Love is not a feeling or an emotion. Do you know how I know that? Do you know how I know that love is not a feeling or an emotion? Because Jesus said, love your enemies. I heard a pastor uh, one time who, who said that he had a man come to him and he said, he said Pastor, I just, I just don't love my wife anymore. I said, we, we just need to get, I just don't love her. And he said, he said uh, well, here's what you need to do. You need to go home and love your wife. And he says, well, no, you don't, you don't understand. I, just, I don't have those, those feelings for I don't have that emotion. He says, well, here's what you need to do. You need to go home and love your wife. He said, I don't think you're listening to me. He says, he says I'm telling you, I don't love my wife. And, and, the, and the pastor said, I don't care what you feel. If Jesus told us to love our enemies, then it's not about a feeling or an emotion. It's about a choice and an action to love someone. God demonstrated his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Listen to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. But God being rich in mercy 
because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it's a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. But God, being rich in mercy, demonstrated His love for us. That He turned the world upside down so that we could be saved through Jesus' sacrifice on that cross. And if Jesus loved us that much, how much are we supposed to also love one another? And love people in the world enough to tell them the truth. The truth is, our default destination is hell. And it's a very real place. And people who die separated from God spend an eternity there. But Romans tells us if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. That's the greatest news someone will ever hear. That there's a hope. There's a promise if they will place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Church, let's love one another and let's love the world so that that others will experience that good news, that joy, that love of God and come and be a part of the family.